Hello everyone, today is Thursday, June 1st, 2017, and this is the week in charts. First of all, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm honored by your presence. So what we can talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions as usual, your questions on trading, and your favorite stock picks. Just hold off until we get to the charts before asking about stocks. And that's for your benefit. And also for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time and hit return. And the reason I say this is because I want to be able to answer all or certainly as many as possible. And if you put them all in one line, it's going to be hard for me to pick and choose which ones to talk about or remember, I should say, which ones to talk about. Speaking of talking about, what are we going to talk about this week? Well, I'm going to continue my discussion on following a methodology and how it's the hardest, easiest thing you'll ever do. And the reason I say that is because often there's nothing to do. One thing I'm just kind of thinking about as I'm getting geared up for the show is there's this big dichotomy in trading. And it's like on the surface, it's very easy. But then when you go to do it, it's very hard. But if you just come back to the, the reality of what you're trying to accomplish, it's actually fairly easy. Now it's easier said than done. And I'm going to flesh that out when we get a little further into the show and talk about psychology. I want to talk a little bit about this course that I'm finally uh, publishing. Now what are we going to focus on? We're going to focus on trading the textbook TKO. Last week we had a TKO. Week before I think we would talked about it and and I gave you the parameters last week. It triggered, it hit the initial profit target and then the stop was brought up to break even. And I'm going to show you how that panned out in a minute. I also have a live example on discretion on how to squeeze out some additional profits. And all this has got me thinking about something I've actually been thinking about quite a bit. Why trading is so hard, but it doesn't have to be. And I'm coming back to that dichotomy thing, kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth. And hopefully by the end of the show, I'll be able to flesh that out. And there's that, that's what I was talking about earlier. I exercise you just a tiny bit of discretion to squeeze out some profits, and that's another live example. That'll make sense in a minute. All right, before we get started, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you could lose money trading. Um, I don't know if you guys ever read these things, but there's some interesting things in there like uh, don't take a sleeping pill and a laxative pill on the same night, and things like that. But... For the most part, I could sum it up, all predictions about the future, and eh, a lot of stuff can happen between now. And then that's from my good friend Greg Morris. Now, I want to continue to follow up on this. I'm going to rush through it a little bit. Not rush through it, but I'm going to get covered as quickly as possible. About a couple of months ago, the open portfolio, not that it's always profitable, not that we don't have losses, not that we have drawdowns, but the point I was trying to make is when some people got a little antsy because we were about to go negative on this and some of the positions were giving up some open profits, specifically this one here, the question is, and it always is, to avoid pain, what do you do? Well, you want to consider bailing out on everything. Well, usually that's a wrong thing to do longer term. Shorter term, it, it feels good, and shorter term, it often works by doing that. But that's the, and I think the word of the day is dichotomy. What feels good shorter term doesn't work longer term. And again, we'll get to that in the uh, description. Hello, Tiger Wood. Why are you saying that? And the point I was trying to make is that, well, let's just see how it shakes out. And sometimes all you need is one good trade. One good trend pays for them all. And let's take a look at what happened since. So here's the portfolio back on 2.7. And as you can see, it was on the cusp of going negative. And here's that same portfolio. Now, keep in mind, we have added and subtracted stocks to the portfolio. And I don't think I have a live snapshot this week. I did have one last week, if you want to look at it. But you can also look at the sample service on my website. Usually, that's about a week or so behind, so you can get an idea of what's going on. 
in the portfolio. But I'll show you what's in it in, in a second if you like. And this is where that portfolio was as of last night. Now, here's the deal. As I just said, one good trend pays for them all. Well, the only stock that's still open right now is this KEM. And you could see that if you would have bailed out, you would have missed out on a significant amount of profit. So it's 1,000 plus 4,510. So what's that? Fifty-five hundred dollars round numbers versus forty-three or forty-two hundred dollars round numbers here. I'm sorry. Uh, what you that would come out of this right here, and you'd be a bit of a hurt and pop. So you'd have missed out on that. So the majority, all these gains, are all in this one position. So let me rewind that a second to explain what I'm trying to say. So if you look at this portfolio. This one stopped out at a gain. This one stopped out at a loss. This one stopped out at a gain. And this one stopped out at a loss. i got to fix this. So this number might actually be a little bit worse than that. I meant to fix that last week. But let's say you got a $4,500, 40, what would that be? $3,900 here. But anyway, you get the idea. So $3,900 and then 5500 of that, if you take 3500 and subtract 5,500, then this would be a major negative here. And worse than that, if you go back to the original portfolio, I said I wanted to spend time on this, but you could see that in some cases, some additional profits were had in the other position. So you only had about, what, let's say $600 times two, $1,200 here, and then that went to 5,500. So I, I know I kind of screwed it up, but the, the point I'm trying to make, and I'm, I guess I'm kind of rushing through it because we've talked about this for the last 20 weeks. So go back and, and watch the last uh, 20 episodes. But the point I'm trying to make is just follow through. It won't always work this well by following through, but longer term, that's a thing to do. Okay? So we get to say bye, Felicia, one more time. So let's talk about a recap on the nuances of volatility. And I'm just going to go through this quickly. Now, one thing that we talked about last couple of weeks is that volatility cycles between overbought and oversold, if you want to call it that, or let's just call it low and high. Okay, It cycles between lows and highs. And as Connor said many years ago, it's more cyclical than price. And that led me on a volatility tangent for quite a while. I never did leave, leave trend, as I said, last couple of weeks. But I did go on this volatility. Um, I wouldn't call it a grail hunt, but I was hoping it would turn out to be a grail hunt. And it didn't, but what's kind of cool is I did learn a lot about it. And volatility, when it dries up and becomes real low, it tends to overshoot to the upside. And we could use that to our advantage, especially if we wait for the first move, ignore it, and then take the false move. And this research goes all the way back to 1998. I'm dating myself just a tad bit here. I did an article in Stocks and Commodities. And you could actually find that if you dig around the Internet enough. So the point was that we had this super-duper low volatility and this is a 6 versus 50 HV. Again, I'm not going to go into the details because we talked about it last week. But it's just a 6-day volatility reading versus a 50-day volatility reading. Statistical volatility or historical volatility, whatever you want to call it. Which I can give you the formula for Telechart. And I think I have the formula for Metastack. But you could probably find that just by looking on the Internet. So... As you can see, we had this massive expansion in volatility and the stock market began to sell off. So that created a bit of a panic. But actually, it just created a TKO move. So the point is that, oh, there's the label. So that's a 6 divided by 50 HV. So the point is that the first move is often a false one. Now, like I said, I did spend a lot of time studying volatility. and I would recommend you, I used to trade it in and of itself, but I would recommend you to not trade it in and of itself, but rather 
use it to your advantage. So when I see a situation where volatility is low and I see a trend knockout, then I know I have two things working for me. And it actually will test out. Back then I did a lot of mechanical testing and I did a lot of the low volatility fake out things and they'll test out. But it's a shorter term edge. And I'm not a huge fan of shorter term edges anymore, except as they relate to my methodology, if they give me a little boost into that shorter term profit, which can turn into a longer term profit, then that's fantastic. Now, the reason I'm not as big a fan of short term edges is, in and of themselves at least, is because I think trading for only the short term is a mistake. Okay. And the reason I think it's a mistake is because something bad can still happen. And if you're only in the market for a short period of time, as a general statement, markets usually only move a certain distance over a short period of time. So it's going to be much harder to capture a very large profit. Unfortunately, the black swan still exists. In other words, you could get whacked really hard. And if your gains are limited and your losses are unlimited, that could be a recipe of disaster. So I don't trade it in and of itself, but learn the nuances so you can incorporate it to your setups and analysis. Now, let's talk about the beauty of a textbook TKO. And a textbook TKO is when you have a nice wide range bar down within a nice trend. And this trend's a lot stronger than it looks because this is actually just a, sna a zoomed in snapshot. So let's take a look at what that looks like on a chart and then let's go back to the NASDAQ or specifically the Qs, not the NASDAQ, but the Qs because it's a tradable vehicle, so we can do a little walkthrough on that. So occasionally you get a nicely defined entry and a stop point where you can take those two, do a little math, subtract the stop from the entry, and then add that difference to the entry, and that gives you the initial profit target. And that'll make sense in a minute. So we're looking for a wide range bar down with a poor close, meaning that it closes at or close to the lows. This means that they were selling going into the close of the stock or certainly no buying. If people had sold out sometime during the day, nobody came in to buy it at the end of the day. So that means that nobody wanted it. Now, if the market could turn all the way back around and go all the way back up and trigger an entry, then you might just have something. You might have a bona fide trend. Now, the reason to call it a trend knockout is because it knocks out the trend followers, especially the Johnny-come-latelys who are buying into the highs. They just throw in a towel and buy it, whatever the cost. It also sucks in the shorts. Shorts tend to be a little bit more egotistical than longs, and I'm not sure why that is, but the shorts tend to confuse the issue with facts. They tend to sometimes incorporate fundamentals as to why a stock does not deserve high valuations, and they fight the trend. In fact, as I learned to my surprise when I spoke at a conference last fall in Vegas, and it was predominantly a lot of day traders, and they, they're, they're, one of their strategies was shorting parabolics. Which, which will work until it don't. And there's actually some GoFundMe accounts out there from people who have been wiped out doing such things. But to each his own. I mean, if that's what you do, then do it. And just know that you could get into a lot of trouble doing that and have some sort of money management plan in place and don't be a gunslinger. And I'm going to talk a little bit about planning in just one second. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that Shorts tend to confuse the issue with facts, tend to like to short high momentum, and for some reason they have these, these egos. And as I said in the conference, I kind of said it on the fly, uh, Mark Douglas, the late great Mark Douglas once said, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. And so I was like, I was up there talking to these guys, and I'm saying, well, as a momentum trader, you know, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade trade well now it's nice to meet you now it's nice to know who that guy is on the other side of the trade so again if it triggers you got these people shaken out or sucked in for in the case of the shorts 
And then your risk is going to be your entry minus your stop. And then if you add that to the entry, that becomes your initial profit target. Now, this is one for one. But Dave, I thought you have to have multiple to one. No, no, no. That sounds good on paper, but it doesn't work in reality. I've done a few presentations on that. But Dave, doesn't it have a negative expectancy? Well, it does unless you, unless all you get is your one for one. Remember, we're going to sell half at one for one, and then we're going to hold on to a piece for hopefully many times to one. So when you do have this textbook TKO, it should it should stick out like a sore thumb. And when we get to the Nasdaq and Q's example, more specifically, it's gonna it should be easy to recognize. You should be able to recognize it. So in this particular case, what I love about a textbook TKO, and they don't happen that often, but if you're patient, they will. You have the methodology check, and then you have money management check. So all that's left to do is just follow the plan. So you got methodology, money management, all that's left is mind of the three trading pillars. Now, this is what I mean about how it should stick out like a sore thrum, thumb. Blech. So the big blue arrow, I guess in this case it's red. I wonder if I could make it blue. Talk amongst yourselves. Is there a way to do this? I don't know. Anyway, it's red so it shows up. But the big arrow is pointing higher, and then you got this obvious knockout bar. Again, it should stick out like a sore thumb. And by the way, that's one thing you'll find. There's a blue arrow. That's one thing you'll find in trading as you gain a little experience. The best setups will begin to jump out at you. I don't want to go into a lot of detail because I've covered it before, and I'm also getting ready to do a video on it, which is part of the Trading Full Circle course. And the, the point I'm going to make is that, as, as a client pointed out to me, he was talking about counterfeit currency detectives. And they don't become who they are and learn their trade by studying a lot of fakes. They don't pull up a bunch of Monopoly money and go, yeah, this one's fake. $1,000 bill that's orange or whatever color it is, I forget, is fake. The, the little tiny $100 yellow bill. Yep, that's fake. No, they look at real $100 bills and they look for certain things in that bill and they study them. And from doing that, the fakes become obvious. So if you want to get good at success, study success. If you want to get good at picking good stocks, study good stocks. And you can see in this particular case, the Qs accelerated higher. And again, they had a very obvious knockout type of bar. So entry above the high, stop below the low, okay? Plus, ideally, a little wiggle room on both of those to avoid getting triggered in on noise alone. But it'd be pretty serious noise for the market to come all the way back up and trigger. And a stop below the low. So let's follow through on that. So we had a wide range bar down. And you'd have an entry above the high. And again, like I said a second ago, you might give it a tiny bit of wiggle room above that high in the case of a textbook TKL. Now, when we get to another example in a second, I'm going to show you where I gave it a lot more room on a pullback type of trade. And that's to avoid being triggered on noise alone. If you had a TKO where the close was way up here, then by all means, you'd want to give it a little more wiggle room. But the fact that it's come, all, it has to come all the way back up here to trigger, and if it does, you might have a bona fide resumption of trend in place, then you could trade it again in a more textbook fashion, which by textbook, I mean entry above the high, stop below the low. And then obviously, if you take your entry and minus your stop, that's going to be your risk. And you add that risk again into your, I'm sorry, add that risk to your entry and broadcast that up or move that up, I should say. And that's going to give you your initial profit target. So here's the math on that from last week. Let's just say high plus one cent. And again, you might give it a little wiggle room. 
and low minus one cent. And again, you might give that a little wiggle room too. Gives you a total risk of 274. And if you add the entry to 274, it gives you an initial profit target of 152, which we hit. And I forget whether we hit that. That was, I think, yeah, that was hit on a gap. I'm sorry. So you got a little bit better than 152 if you took profits on the gap. If um, if you just did high minus low without one cent, I think the initial profit target would have been right here. So that was that's why I'm getting a little tripped up. But it did hit the gap, and so the on the gap would have been the exit for the initial profit target. So if we take a look at this and we begin to follow through a little bit. As the market, the trigger is here, okay, so you wouldn't mean to trade till that day, and then you'd have your stop put in, or you put your stop in. Now, notice that it went up just a little bit. In reality, I wouldn't bother trailing a stop higher, but the point I want to make here is that on the initial loaf, in other words, let's say you're trading 200 shares, On the first 100 shares, or, well, uh, let me just start over. So you got 200 shares on. Well, initially, you're going to trail that on mostly a one-for-one -one basis. Now, the reason I say mostly is I've become a little bit more lenient in recent years, and I'm trailing a little bit more loosely. But learn things mechanically first and then seek to improve them. So if you were trailing on a one-for-one -one basis, then you could see as these trailing stops go in, they stair step higher. So if the market goes up a little bit, the stop goes up a little bit. And then you can see at this particular case here, when the initial profit target was hit, this stop gets moved up to break even. Okay. So now what's going to happen is we're going to slowly allow that stop or gradually allow that stop to, let me redraw that. So the stop here is kind of stair stepped higher on a one from one basis. Now, if this market continues to move in our favor, then we're going to gradually trail that stop higher, often by not doing anything. In other words, let's say the market goes up 10 cents, we're not going to bother raising our stop. I call that keep the change. Let's say the market rallies two points, we might only raise our stop one point to allow that stop to widen out to the longer term volatility of the market. Is there a time window in which the TKO setup must trigger? That's a good question. And my answer is going to, my first answer, my quick answer is it depends. My second answer is yes, and it's going to be a little bit quicker than just a pullback, a generic pullback. So let me draw that in a little bit. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about exacts here in just one minute. But it's a good uh, it's a good question, and if I can get this thing to work, here we go. Blank screen. Here we go. So, say you've got a stock that's in a really super duper trend, and you've got a big TKO. Well, as a general statement, I like a pullback to trigger or a pullback number of days should be one, and that would be a TKO, to let's say around eight days or so. And after that, I begin to question a little bit. But with the TKO, sometimes you'll get this wide range bar down, and you might get like a drifting action up like this, and then it begins to meander. I'm not as excited about this TKO as I am on day one. So let's say this is day one, because on day one, people are knocked out, and if it comes all the way back up here and triggers, especially if it's like a textbook TKO like we just talked about, then a lot of people are off guard. Think about the people behind the bars, okay? They, they aren't just little squiggles. The bars aren't just little squiggles on a chart. They're actual people who have traded the vehicle or the stock, whatever you may be trading. So if they're knocked out like, bam, and then the market goes right back up like, bam, then they don't have much time to jockey for position. But if it kind of meanders up and meanders down, like I've drawn in here, 
then some of that supply or whatever you want to call it works its way through the system. Okay. So I don't have a quick answer to that. It depends, but you will notice if you're following along in the trading service or a delayed trading service, whatever the case may be, you notice that as a general statement, the TKOs that don't trigger come off the service quicker than a generic pullback. Now, sometimes a TKO might turn into a generic pullback or some sort of pullback pattern. And in that particular case, let's say the market drifts lower a little bit like this, I might be willing to leave them on for a few more days. So it's, it depends. So if it does something like this, if it drifts higher and then lower again, then I'm going to scratch my head and think, well, is this stock still, does this stock still have potential? But if it continues to drift lower, it might just be part of a correction that started with this TKO. And then at this point, I might trade it more like a generic pullback. So the TKO becomes a generic pullback. Okay, let's just call it a pullback. Whereas this is still kind of a TKO, okay? So I know I didn't give you a quick answer, but in an ideal world, you want to see them trigger on day two or day, however you want to look at it. Day one, you have the setup. Day two, you go after the setup. You want to see them trigger on that day, okay? Uh, Aziz wants to know, I hope I'm saying your name right. What do, you, what do I mean by a poor close? A poor close is when a stock, let's just do this again. Let's see if we can get rid of this. And again, if you watch the um, first four videos in Trading Full Circle, which is free, I go into a lot of detail about the one bar patterns. Now, you don't necessarily want to want to rush out and, and define a trend or trade a stock off a one bar pattern, but they can help. And in some cases, you have a TKO that sets up within a one bar which is just a one bar pattern. So by poor close, I mean it closes down here towards the bottom of its range. Okay, so that means that this is what's called a supply day. And then again, if you watch the third video of the series, and it's free, you'll see me talk a lot about supply days and demand days. So on a supply day, it means that people want out of a stock. So they're willing to drop the price they want for the stock okay, to meet with the sellers. I'm sorry, to meet with the buyers. The buyers don't want to buy the stock, so they say, all right, if you want to sell me your stock, your garbage, I'm going to lower the price to something that's kind of a ridiculous or a value zone or something, and that's what's happening there, okay? So the selling, when it closes poorly, like down towards, this would be bad close or a poor close. Okay, this would be a good close up here. So if it closes, if it has a good close, it's towards the top of the range. A bad close is towards the bottom of the range. So this would be a demand day. This would be a supply day. Okay. And watch the video. I'll walk you through it. All right. So let's, good questions. I'm glad that uh, we're on topic here. So anyway, the point was that I wanted to show how even in a textbook manner you could follow along with something like this. There we go. We can make it blue. Well, it didn't work. Doesn't matter. Okay. Now when it comes to trading, a little discretion can go a long ways. Keep in mind that anytime you add a layer of discretion, you're adding additional decisions to the process. And as I often say, you want to make as few decisions as possible as a general statement. But sometimes a tiny bit of discretion can make all the difference in the world. For instance, let's say you have a stop at $9.00 and the stock goes to $9, maybe $8.99, but there's not a whole lot of trading at that level, and then all of a sudden it begins to reverse, and now it's at $9.15 or $9.30 or whatever the case may be, then you could stay with the stock, and that's what I call a stock, a stop nick, okay? It's not saying throw caution and win, and your stop's at 9, it goes to 8, goes to 7, goes to 6, goes to 5, then you're just flat out wrong. You really should get out. 
But what I'm saying is how exercising a little discretion can make all the difference in the world. Now, if you take a look at this trade here in Coop, and this kind of dovetails in, and this has got this is what's got me thinking about why trading is hard for so many, and present company assume uh, included. Okay, I'm not immune, which I'll get to in just one second. But the buy was at 30.30, okay, with initial profit target of 35.10. So the buy came in right around here, and the initial profit target was up here. So we're looking for, on a 100K account, we're looking for a 1% move or $1,000 cash on the first half of the trade, okay? So you actually take these shares, and I, in reality, you'd round down, in this case, 400, so it's 200, 200. So 200 would be a trading loaf, so to speak, or a swing trade portion, and 200 would be a trend trade portion. Now, they're all bought at once, but you scale out a half when the initial profit target is hit. So here's 35.10. And notice that it came really close to it. And then notice it came really close and actually closed nearly there. And I think it was at 946 per 100K, which is, what's that, 9.46, as opposed to 1%. Okay, close enough. I think I screwed that up again. So it was 946 would be 0.946% versus 1%, okay? So you're only 50 bucks off, and that's even on a closing basis. So at the close or near the close, you're thinking, geez, you know, I'm only looking for 1000 bucks on the first loaf of this trade. Eh, what's another 50 bucks? giving up 50 bucks sitting around waiting? And it's just not worth it. And then you can see the following day, or yesterday, I should say, which was the following day, it sold off. So the point I'm trying to make is you could exercise a little bit of discretion and use your brain and say, well, that's close enough for government work. The market doesn't always move in exacts. One time I was talk, talking about a stop, Nick, just use your imagination, and the stop was set at 9. That's why I said 9 earlier. And it just hit 9. It didn't even trade below 9. It had 200 shares trade around 9. And then it turned around and went right back up. So my point was stick with the trade. And then somebody in one of these weekend charts, when I was giving the example, said, well, why? why? How come you just didn't set your stop at 8.99, at 899? I'm like, nobody is that good, okay? If you could get it down to the penny, then you need to go out and make a bunch of money. Just sit on your boat and trade. That's all you do. But nobody is that good, okay? But you can use your brain and exercise a little discretion. So the point is, don't split hairs. I know I've given this speech a thousand times, and I'll probably give it a thousand more, but don't split hairs when it comes to taking partial profits, especially when it kind of flirts with that area for a few days and just doesn't quite get there. And that's what really makes you a really good trader. That's how you move from that beginning or novice trader to the next level is learning how to do these things such as discretion. Now, if you're not good at discretion, there's nothing wrong with following things a little bit more mechanically until you can develop the discipline to apply a little discretion. My point is that you're going to make a lot more money longer term by applying a little bit of discretion. Shorter term, it might not work out. Shorter term, this stock might gap open 10 points, and then mechanically you would have made a lot more money. But as a general statement, some of these common sense things when it comes to applying discretion can really help out. Now, all this, specifically this coop example, really got me thinking about why it's hard to trade. And I've been thinking about this one. And the reason I've been thinking about it ever since we had this gap down, because initially it looked like easy money because it just kind of took off from the entry, and then it had a big gap down. But the stop wasn't hit, okay? So what do you do? Well, you followed a plan. Yeah, but David sold off. 
we should get out. There's something wrong. Well, there might be something wrong, but follow your plan. And I don't know where the stop was on that particular day, but let's just say it's down here. Obviously, it didn't stop out. You just follow your plan. Now, it hurts and it sucks, but follow the plan. And this happens all the time. We have quite a few stocks that we'll get in stock and we're long and everything is doing pretty good. It goes flat for a while. It might have like a knockout move and then it takes off. Okay. Most of my clients are going to bail out when they get bored here. And then the other or 70%, let's just say 50% is going to bail out here. 40% are going to bail out here because they don't feel like they don't want to endure any more pain. And then the other 10% are going to ride this out. Okay. Now I'd like to make this 10% 100%. And it's getting better. I've gotten people that have been with me for years and years and years. And they're like, Dave, I get it. Sometimes stocks go up. Sometimes they go down. Sometimes we might have sit on our hands and we might have bad quarters or a couple of bad quarters, but I get it. Longer term, the trend is your friend and we should follow it over the short to intermediate term. It can suck quite a bit. All right, let's get into the trading psychology here. So trades like Coop, again, got me thinking, or have gotten me thinking, I should say, about why it's so hard to trade. So why you can't trade? And then the question is, or can you? Well, part of the problem is, and I think this is going to develop into something much bigger. This is an article I've been wanting to write for a long, long time. So it's just kind of beginning to flesh it out a little bit a few minutes before the show as I put this last slide in. Well, one reason you can't trade is because you wing it. And you don't plan and follow the plan. You don't plan your trade and trade to plan. I know it's cliche, but it's one of the biggest problems that I see. So why do you wing it? Well, first of all, it's a lot more fun to wing it. And as I'll point out in a minute, trading them properly can be quite boring. And I went for a walk a while back. Well, it's actually been a few years now. And I wanted to figure out, I wanted to think about why this is. And a couple of miles later, I realized why it is. I wanted to figure out why people don't plan. People might plan their lives, but they don't plan their trades. The same people who are AR or OCD or you know whatever the latest buzzword is in their lives, which make this these these unbelievable plans. They they just can't wing it. They just can't wing it in, in real life. Are often the same people when it comes to trading that wing it. And I couldn't figure that out. Anyway, long story endless. I know too late. I went for a walk and I got to thinking about it and it hit me. It's like the reason people won't plan a trade to begin with is because the moment you plan a trade is the moment you have to realize you could be wrong. And one of the reasons that people don't follow the plan, amongst some others, we'll get to in just one second, but one of the reasons that they don't follow the plan is that as soon as you take that loss, Provided, of course, you've been stopped out of the trade. But as soon as you take that loss, you have to admit that you could be wrong. I'm sorry, you have to admit that you're wrong. Okay? Uh, it'll come back. You know, you're living, in, you're living in hope, okay? You're smoking the hopium, hoping that it'll come back. But once you actually take that loss, provided, of course, you're stopped out, then the reality sets in. The reality is a reality. Now, following a plan is hard. And one reason it's hard is because we're wired for action. And I'm going to I'm going to pick on the millennials here in just one minute. But especially the millennials, okay? Because you're bombarded with all this stuff and there's always something going on. And 
And, you know, social media, it's like everybody's on vacation and doing all these things, and you feel like you need to be doing something. It's kind of interesting. Back in my MD, MBA days, uh, we watched a film, not because they didn't have VCRs back then, but it was actually a film. And I don't remember the guy's name, but it was a very good film. And his point was that society was moving so fast that it was creating this overstimulation for everyone. This is back before cell phones were very prevalent, or I don't even know if they existed back then. And his point, he made the point that, that they showed a space shuttle launch, which interrupted an NBA game, and then the network had a new policy. They would never show another space shuttle loss during an NBA game because... People didn't want, as exciting as that is, they didn't want to, they, they were more interested in the game. They didn't want to be interrupted in that game or whatever. And he, he gave an example of radio and how on a radio it's like it's always exciting, something's always going on, it's always a party or something. And it's like his point was he wanted to see what was going to happen in the future. Now I'm sure he's long dead and gone based on the... Um, I'm sure he's dead and gone based on the margin call. <laughs> based on his age at the time and the age of the film. So he didn't get to see what this society has become with this constant stimulation. Okay? And I think he would be amazed if he saw all these things we have that we didn't have back then, or at least not at that level the cell phones, the social media, the constant, constant, the, the 500 channels on TV, but nothing's on, you know, there's nothing on TV. You got 500 channels. There's got to be something, you know, let's look at Netflix. That's not on Netflix either. Okay. So we're wired for action and society is making this even worse as each day goes by. And, as human beings, and this is one thing that's been fascinating me in more recent times, over the past several years, I've been getting heavily into this from the psychological standpoint of trading. And it's not just the trading psychology, but it's also the physiolo physiology, physiology, easy for me to say. We're not made to do certain things, okay? We're not made to trade because we have this little part of our brain, which is very small. And I guess it's small so it can be very efficient and give you that reflexive type of action. You touch a hot stove. You don't want to say, oh, is it really hot? Is it that hot? I'm not so sure. Why is it hot? Did I leave it on? Wow, that's really hot, isn't it? And while your flesh burns, you want to immediately jerk your hand back. So I think the reason that this part of the brain is, and any of you um, doctors in here might be able to, to help me out on this, but I think the reason it's so small, this emotional part of your brain, is so it can make these quick snap decisions necessary to get you out of the way of an oncoming cab, okay? As I often say, you don't want to contemplate, well, why is this guy coming at me? Does he like, like me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with him? Can we... Well, who was it, uh, Reginald Denny? Can we all get along? You know. <laughs> so we have these physiological parts of us that make it difficult to trade. So it's like it's hard enough that from a psychological standpoint, it's hard to trade. But we also have things from a physiological standpoint. But here's the beauty of that. If you recognize it, as I've talked about, before and as I get heavily into when we get into the psychology of trading in the, in the uh, you know here's a shameless plug in the trading full circuit course I'm just I'm very proud of this work as you can tell and this is where a lot of what I'm talking about over the last couple of years has come from in this uh, in these weekend charts but if you embrace the fact that we have physiological things such as the amygdala in our brain and you understand how it works. It only takes a few seconds to bypass that. And I think it was Robert Mara, Dr. Robert Mara, talked about tiptoe past your fears, okay? And he has an excellent book 
Um, I need to find, see if I have it here somewhere in this messy office of mine. Um, but I've mentioned it before, and Dr. Robert Marr, I think it's the Kaizen way. I want to, I want to say that's what it is. It's about uh, how one small step can uh, change your life. It's a good little book, and I saw a really great speech from him at the aforementioned conference when they were talking a lot about trading psychology. But the point is, if you recognize things such as the physiological problem that we all have in us, this little small emotional part of our brain, the amygdala, part of the limbic system, you can tiptoe past that, quoting Dr. Robert Murray, you can tiptoe past it by simply doing a few things. I wrote an article recently, it's on the website, where I talk about wind the clock, and that's based on Greg Morris being in flight simulators. I got a little airline clock. I don't know if you can hear me winding it now, but I literally wind this clock every time I make a trade. And Greg talked about in his book, what's the name of his book? Uh, Investing with the Trend. He talked about when he was in flight school to learn how to fly jets, they put you in a simulator and they try to stress you out by flashes and alarms and all kinds of things happening. And they try to freak you out so you do the wrong thing, shut off the wrong engine, or do something that would crash the jet. Okay, they stress test you. And he was not immune to a lot of the problems that everyone else was having in these simulators. And he said back then the clocks were analog, so he figured out that he if he would just wind the clock when the shit hit the fan, so to speak, it would give him enough time to think about what to do. Well, he, back that's back before um, this book was written by Dr. Robin Marr, long before that. But basically what Greg was doing without knowing it, I guess, and knowing it based on this theory, was he was tiptoeing past his fears. And the same thing, actually, he would do the same thing when he was flying commercial jets. When, when an engine went out in one of his flights, you know, it's like he wound the clock. Well, the clocks were digital by then, but he kind of symbolically pretended to wind the clock. And that gives you a few seconds to think about things and not hurry up and shut off that the wrong engine. Shut off the good engine that's still running. Okay. So from a physiological standpoint, we're not wired to trade. And from a psychological standpoint, we're not wired to trade. And that's because the real world and the trading world are two different worlds. You crave action. Trading can be quite boring, as I'll get to in one second. Even more boring than Dave Landry's The Week in Charts. <laughs> uh, we like to deal in exacts, and we're kind of wired for exacts, okay? As I was putting together my slides, I was thinking a good example in life would be waiting on the cable guy. Who wants to do that? I'll be uh, – I'll be there sometime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., you know? So who wants to sit around all day and wait for the cable guy? If he tells you to be there at 12 o'clock sharp, eh, no problem, right? So we like to deal in exacts. I was speaking in, I think it was February, Traders Expo in New York, and I was doing the long session, the four-hour session, and I started showing the patterns and, and explaining the patterns, and one guy was like, oh, well, it seems arbitrary. And I'm like, well, yeah, it might seem a little bit at, at first, but once you begin looking at the charts, as I said a few minutes ago, it'll begin to stick out like a sore thumb, this TKO within a nice persistent trend. And I could tell that he wasn't really buying my answer, but the point is that with a little experience, it won't seem so arbitrary. But people want well-defined things. Now, I don't want to digress too far. I know, imagine that, me digress. But it would be nice if a mechanical system worked and you could just follow along with a mechanical system. But it, it's not that easy, okay? Because a mechanical system is going to look for a certain exact thing in the market. If it's one penny off, which might be a, the mother of all setups, it's not going to show you that setup, okay? And, of course, it might get you out if it's one penny beyond the stop or whatever, and as I just talked about a few minutes ago, a little discretion can really help you out. So I think mechanical systems have their purpose in that they can educate you about the markets. You can learn from them, 
but I would recommend that you not trade things on a pure mechanical basis. And I've done many, many years of mechanical testing. I used to wake up early. I still wake up early, but I used to wake up early and program for three or four hours every morning. And I've developed, I think, 3,000 systems in the process. Now, it's not as many as it sounds because maybe I'm just tweaking parameters on one or adding another parameter or something. It's not necessarily 3,000 systems, different systems, I should say. And by the way, they all start to look the same after a while, okay? Either you're a breakout player and that's going to have its nuances. Either you're a pullback player and that's going to have its nuances. Or you're a contra trend player and that's going to have its nuance. So they all look the same after a while. And there's probably not that many systems out there. You know, you could probably boil it all down to one or three little pigeon hoes. But anyway, I digress. But we do like to deal in exacts. Logic doesn't often apply. And this is something that I, that, and, and again, this is in the first four videos alone. So just watch those videos on my website. And they're not that long. Uh, but I talk about Tom McClellan's reasoning that when you buy a stock, you're not only forming a relationship between you and the company, and you expect the company to do great things. And every now and then the SEO, 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 I'm thinking of uh, Google. <laughs> the CEO, every now and then the CEO might grope his secretary without the secretary's permission, you know, grab her by the whatever, without a permission, and then that goes public and he gets in a lot of trouble and the, and the stock tumbles. Or uh, there are some worse things that the CEO might do. But as a general statement, they have your best interests in mind, okay? But in addition to forming a relationship between you and that company, you are also forming a relationship with anyone who has bought that stock prior to you. And as Tom McClellan went on to say, and those people will screw you. And as his, I'm giving you the whole speech now, <laughs> as his mother, his late mother Marion used to say, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money, while others use methods that are far more sophisticated. And that's true. Have you ever sold a stock because you needed money? Okay. And think about, let's say somebody's, somebody's a buy and hold, quote unquote, player, where they just hold on forever. Well, guess what? You get a market like 2008, and you've got an Ivy League school lined up for junior, and the market begins selling off. And now, his college fund is about three quarters of what it was. And maybe now it's like half of what it was and you don't want to send him to a junior college. <laughs> what do you do? Well, you're going to have to sell and that has nothing to do. doesn't have anything to do with the underlying market condition. So logic doesn't often apply. You're dealing with a bunch of other emotional beings. You don't have patience for a lot of those aforementioned reasons with this microwave society that we're living in. Case in point, last Saturday, my 23-year-old millennial daughter nutted up because my wife had to change cell phone carriers. She, my wife owns her own business. She had, she had, you know, long story endless, she had to change carriers. And out of the deal, she was going to give my daughter a free brand new $800 phone, okay? And my 23-year-old millennial was nutting up because they were going to have to turn off the old phone carrier and switch over to the new phone carrier, which takes several hours. And she was losing her shit because she was going to be without a phone for several hours. Okay? And it's not like she was going anywhere or doing anything that would require you to have a phone. I, you know, how did we live without phones? You know, <laughs> we just did. Anyway, so I think the society has trained us with all this instant gratification. The so-called microwave society has ruined us. And I was thinking right as I was going live with this pre presentation, it's like I think us Otis farts might have an advantage because we're not addicted to all these these things, okay? So be careful because I think society is making you a bad trader. And you're going to have to have patience. And there's two types of 
patience. And one is to try to force things to happen. If you've been following along my service up until last few days, I've gone a couple of weeks without recommending anything. Now, I always lose clients when I do that. I don't care, okay? I don't care because those clients shouldn't be trading anyway. All right, a little tough love there. But sometimes there's nothing to do, and you can't try to force something to happen. And you got to be really careful. And I think it was Ed Zakota or someone, um, somebody else in Market Wizards, but I think it was Ed Zakota said having a quote machine on your desk is like having a slot machine. You're going to want to feed it because you're always thinking something's going on. And if you're watching every little tick, it's going to look a lot bigger than it really is, okay? And I always like to, if I do ever find myself looking at an intraday chart, I always like to look at a daily and a weekly to put things in perspective and say, wait a minute, this little blip right here isn't really that big of a deal, although it looks like a huge bar on a screen. But you can't force things to happen. And if there is a secret to trading, it's patience. And I've written about this extensively on the site. But if you could be patient enough to to wait for that that so-called fat pitch, I'm not a baseball fan, I'm not a big sports fan, but I did a little research into why they call it the fat pitch, and the, the reason is because the 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 batter when he gets that fat pitch, he says the the, the baseball looks like a cabbage ball, you know, it looks like the size of a cabbage. It's, it, that's why they call it a fat pitch because it's like perfect for them to swing right into him and hit a home run. And, you know, getting back to the psychology thing, I, I also, I couldn't figure out why do the same people who look for perfection in life, the physicians, the engineers, what, they look for the automatic transmission mechanics. They look for perfection in life, but in trading, they're willing to deal with mediocrity. And a psychiatrist who's also a client of mine, Dr. J, explained to me that the reason is because we are trained as professionals, as a doctor, a lawyer, automatic transmission mechanic, we're trained to take whatever train wreck comes along and fix it. We can't wait for that so-called fat pitch, and that makes a lot of sense. So I got the answer to my question there, but you have to try not to force things to happen. You also have to let things unfold. And I see it time and time again. People get bored with a position that doesn't stop out and they move on. And then what happens? The stock gets bought out or the stock takes off and goes up two, three hundred percent without them. So that's another reason. It's not all your fault. It's society in a lot of cases. And it's also really boring. One client of mine. I preached to him over and over, trading done properly can be quite boring, and he was following my stuff, doing pretty good, but then day trading like crazy and losing a lot of money. And then when I would stop recommending setups in the service, but I'd say, okay, guys, this is all I can find, these three or four stocks, I'm not going to do anything, I don't think you should do anything, he was trading like all three or four stocks and trading himself into a hole, and I tried to explain to him over and over. Once you get it, so to speak, it's going to be quite boring. And then that was a big epiphany for him. It's like once he realized that, wait a minute, this is not that exciting, following the plan, following along, waiting for my so-called fat pitch, and that's when he became profitable. And as I often say, if you want some excitement, go to Vegas or have an affair. That way you only lose, what, half of your money. Now, one thing that I see quite often, too, is that, and this is, comes back to the logic thing, trying to avoid losses is often what creates them. And it's kind of funny. I've been, I've been getting a little sucked. You know, here I am telling you, don't get sucked into all these things. But I've been getting a little sucked into social media because I've done some business things with Facebook recently. And it's got me paying attention to what's going on there in a little bit. And somehow I got into a couple of these stock groups. I don't remember signing up for them, but now I'm in them. And I see people that say things that are just flat out wrong or people obviously don't know what they're doing answering novices' questions. Like one guy just asked, like, how do I avoid, how do I mitigate drawdowns or something? And, and you know, somebody's like, uh, 
you got to get out of all your losers. You got to get out, you know, it's like, or, or tight stops. And it's like, well, getting out of all your losers, provided you're not stopped out. And tight stops is exactly how people lose money. And I've said this a thousand times before. I'm sick of me saying it, but I had two people call me. One was stopped out 19 times in a row if memory serves, and one was stopped out 21 times in a row if memory serves. So there's either two problems with getting stopped out that many times. Number one, your stops are too tight, and you're getting stopped out on noise alone. As I often say, there's a popular method out there that says you, could, you should use an 8% stop. That's like saying that every one of us should wear a medium-sized medium shirt, something my fat ass hasn't done since I was five years old. Okay, we had a stock a while back, and it's it's on the website. You can dig it up, and I talked about it quite often. I think it was CNX. We had a 34% stop, 34% stop in the stock. That sounds kind of crazy, even for the swing trade portion, right? But that's what it called for. It was moving around 10, 15, 20% or more in a day or two, or or several days at least. So that's where the stop was. And if you look at the actual chart. By the way, the chart looks something like this, okay? The stop is like right here, the answer is right here. It didn't look like it was that far away, but this stock had made such a massive move off the lows percentage-wise that that's what it called for. So I guarantee you, in one of the biggest trades we've had in the last couple of years, if I had put an 8% stop in that stock, I would have been stopped out nearly immediately. Um, if you go back to that that big outlier we have in the portfolio right now, I guarantee you, you would have been stopped out a long time ago at an 8% stop. So by trying to avoid losses, you're often creating them. And that's where the logic, again, doesn't apply. I think the first article I wrote in this was in 1999 or 2000. Again, I'm dating myself back way back in the trading markets days. I wrote an article called The Myth of Tight Stops, and it might be out there somewhere floating around the Internet. If you can't find that one, there's tons of articles that I've done on the problem of tight stops. Anyway, people don't plan because it is boring. You need to see pleasure more fun to just enter a trade. Yeah, you know, it's it's more fun to wing it. It's a lot more fun to wing it, wing it than plan. Do you ever use a checklist for winning a trade? Yes, yes. Well, the, the, the no example, no rate supply, enough volume, etc. Yeah, yeah. Well, that the the mechanical checklist is all there, uh, or or I, I should say, I'm doing that mechanically. Okay. And you know, this is what it's interesting. You said that because I'll be in webinars with other people, and I'll see people say things, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. But it amazes me, and again, it's I don't want to soft sell you on trading full circle, but little things in there like I talk about, like overhead supply, for instance. Let's say you have a stock, does a lot of trading down here, does like this, and then it sets up, okay? And somebody in a webinar was recommending a stock, and I don't want to throw them in the bus. They recommended buying a stock, and I'm thinking to myself, do they not see this big wad of overhead supply right there? Okay. So I don't have a checklist per se, but it's in the back of my mind. I'm like, ooh, daddy liked this setup. And it's like, well, wait a minute. It's got a lot of overhead supply. You know what? I'm going to pass, okay? And that's why I won't take the trade. Now, the aforementioned article where I talked about winding the clock, there was a – I talked a lot about uh, a trading checklist there. And if I could find it for you um, real quick, I'll uh, I'll show it to you. Okay, uh, any questions, anything so far, and we'll uh, pop out to the, uh, but yeah, that was the point I was trying to make in that article, which I'll find for you real quick, is that you need to have a checklist in mind, or at least part of the article, I should say, because, and the reason is because, let's say, getting to aviation, and I asked Greg about this, and the reason that putting the landing gear down on a plane is because somebody tried to land a plane without putting the landing gear down. So everything that's on that list, up to and including put the landing gear down when you're landing, was actually happened. 
Okay? Okay, I found it. So if you go to my website, I was picking on Greg Morris in this article. I don't think he liked that much, but <laughs> this is the real Greg Morris down here. Right there. But anyway, it's um, if you just do a search on checklists, it'll come up on my website. But the Earl is right here. Trading dash checklist plus one simple thing can keep you out of trouble. And this is where I talked about the pre-trade checklist. Now, I just somebody just asked me about overhead supply right here. Is there clear air above? In other words, no overhead supply. Remember, if there's a significant amount of trading above where you enter, those who bought it will likely be looking to get out of it break even. It's human nature. Does the stock trade cleanly or does it trade like an electrocardiogram? Okay, a lot of the things that we cover in here, and again, you know, getting back to those first four videos, I'm really proud of them. Watch them because when we get to the live charts, you're going to see a lot of the mistakes that are made were covered in those first four videos or even in this article here. But yeah, do I have a checklist? Yes. I mean, it's in my head, but here's your checklist right here for what you need to go through. And there's my clock right there that I wind. Anyway, yeah, read that article. Let me know what you think. All right, let's hop out into the, um, yeah, volumes on there. Uh, not volume as an indicator, but volume as making sure the stock is liquid enough to trade. All right, let's take a look at the overall uh, market, and then we'll drill down some individual sectors. Um, if you guys want to talk about anything, um, any stocks particularly, just punch the symbol in and remember to hit return. And look, let me show you this coop one more time. Okay, what's the high today? $35.99, within 11 cents of the initial profit target. Close enough, okay? Close enough. This HPJ, look at look what happened. It triggered, it came right back in. Okay. I guarantee you most people bailed out when this stock came right back in. Why? Because it's going the wrong way. But as long as you're not stopped out, stick with the position. Morgan Stanley, we're short this one, okay? And it hasn't paid off yet. It's actually negative, but look, we got short way back here three months ago. The day that's dead money. Well, so what? Okay. Let it unfold. We get stopped out, we get stopped out. You have to look at each trade as a cost of doing business, okay? This Kim is for as percent moves. Let me just take a look at something real quick. Let's take a look at that. No, nope, that's not a bad example. But yeah, look at the volatility of this one. 34% move over a week or two. And then let's take a look at this move. 18% move. So obviously an 8% stop would have knocked you out a long time ago on that one. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. There's quite a few things I want to talk about here, but it won't take long. And then keep those stock picks coming. We'll uh, we'll get to as many as we can. All right, first of all, SP500. Bam, winning right up here at all-time highs. Okay, if we close right where we are now, we'll be at all-time highs. That's a good thing, obviously. Back to chart out. So far, we've broken out of this little range. Not so little range, I should say. So far, so good. You know me. Ideally, I'd like to see it accelerate higher, not let back for a while, and then have some orderly pullbacks along the way. But so far, so good. One day at a time. As I preach, when a market is at or near all-time highs, give it the benefit of the doubt. Okay? At new highs, at new highs, at new highs, at new highs, at new highs. Okay, even in this range, it really didn't any, do anything wrong other than just consolidate, okay, and bore you to death. So far, so good. Now, if it begins to break down, you begin to get some signals when we come below this range, then that's going to be a different story. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Decent little day there, too. Not set the world on fire. Up a little bit more than a third of a percent. If it closed where it is now, it would be closing at what? All-time highs. When a market is at or near all-time highs, 
like it was here, 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 like it was here. You get the idea, right? Give it the benefit of the doubt, okay? Now, Rusty's a little hard to give the benefit of the doubt, but I'm not going to get bearish on the Rusty until it proves proves me wrong. I was bearish back here in the Russell, if you guys remember, because it was ugly, okay? But now it's just consolidating by trading sideways. Now, let me interview myself. Would I rush out and buy right now? No, okay? But if I was long this ETF per se, and I had a stop around, let's just say 130, then what would I do? Nothing. Let the trade unfold. Now, the Russell is the fly in the ointment with the overall market. I would like to see this guy break out the new highs. The good news is the Russell's a little bit more volatile, and when it does decide to take off, it's going to do it in a big hurry. So, again, as long as it's at or near all-time highs, and it's not that far away, a couple percent away, let's measure that. Yeah, 2% and change away. So, again, give it the benefit of the doubt. Now, all in great in the world, some areas like energies and other commodity-related areas like metals and mining, not looking so hot. You can see these energies wide and loose and going lower. Metals and mining, wide and loose and going lower. So, what do you do? Well, you just avoid those areas. Take a look at the banks. You can see the banks not looking so hot. It looks like a big picture, complex type of head and shoulder. Don't rush out and trade head and shoulders in and of themselves. But if you see a big picture pattern setting up within something like a head and shoulders, like a first thrust or a bow tie, then by all means, take the trade. Okay. But banks look pretty ugly in here. How's that for a oxymoron from a trend following moron? If you drill down to the regional banks, and I just have a couple of them in here, you can see that they're looking even more uglier than the banks overall. Let's take a look at the bow ties here, okay? So we had a bow tie down in the banks way back here, in the regionals at least. Let's take a look at banks overall. Yeah, we had a bow tie down in the banks back here too, okay, close enough. And then it looks like we're getting a secondary signal here. Sometimes these secondary signals, as you know, can be even more powerful. What's the what? I, what do I often say? The and I didn't invent this term. I just heard it years ago. It stuck in my head. The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. So sometimes these second signals actually works. I actually knew a trader once, and when he would hire guys into his his uh, operation, and they were doing some day trading, he would only let the new guys take second signals, second entries. Okay, after the second signal. And that was because those signals are going to be more accurate. Yes, you would give up a lot of trades, but you also would be getting into more accurate trades. And that was for the guy to build confidence. So if you went to his office in order to, to trade, you had to take only second signals until you became successful, and then you were able to take more and more signals. And this isn't totally related, but one thing that I preach and, and I think it's, in, and again, it's in those first four, I don't know why I'm selling these free videos so hard, but it's in those first four free videos. The point I make is that if you're not successful with the basics, then you're not going to be more successful with more complex methodology. If you can't follow a basic methodology, such as, such as a TKO, an obvious textbook type of TKO, you're not going to be successful with some sort of arcane, Fibonacci or some sort of type of counting methodology or something, you know. Now, let's take a look at some of these other sectors in here. So, banks not looking so hot. Some areas I wouldn't get too excited about, like media not looking so hot. Too much fake news out there, I guess. But for the most part, as you would imagine, with the NASDAQ at new highs, anything technology-related, such as the semiconductors looking pretty good in here, and quite a few other technology areas looking pretty good. Software looking okay, banging out new highs. Um, health services banging out new highs. In fact, today with a little bit of vigor, that looks pretty darn good, doesn't it? Um, defense stocks have been banging out new highs lately. Let's take a look at the transports. Last week, somebody was worried, or two weeks ago, somebody's worried about the transports. The IYT doesn't look quite as good as this one. 
but they were worried because it was down here. And I was like, well, it looks ugly, but it's stuck in a range. I wouldn't rush out and buy them, but there's no need to sell the form because the transports weren't confirming the action that we're seeing in the overall market or certainly the NASDAQ. And I'm not a big Dow theorist, but it is important for the transports to, to rally along with the overall market. Let me interview myself. Will I buy a market if the transports are weak? Yeah, absolutely. If the market's going up, so what? Okay. Do I like to have the transports confirm? Absolutely. I'm actually a bigger fan of having the semiconductors confirm what's going on in the transports. But hey, the more pieces that fit, the better. And take a look at the, uh, the uh, transports busting out to new highs today. Okay, so far, so good. Now, keep in mind, there's always something to worry about. And I'm kind of glad I was in, I hosted uh, the Timing Research Show again yesterday. And it uh, seems like everybody in there was pretty bearish. And I was the only guy bullish. Why were you bullish, Dave? Well, because I'm a trend-following moron, okay? I'm not smart enough to be bearish, okay? <laughs> I'm not smart enough to catch a top. And by the way, nobody is. But they had some pretty convincing arguments. The banks are weak. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Commodities are abysmal. Yes, they are, okay? But the market's going up, so far at least. And then again, let's give it the benefit of the doubt, okay? I've given up trying to outsmart the markets many, many years ago. Just follow along. Just do it. All right. I think I've kind of beat the dead horse on everything today. So let's uh, hop into some uh, individual stock questions. F up. Oh. Hey, Rick, that's today's uh, setup. Uh, one of today's setups, I should say. So good job on that. High five to you. You have picked it. Uh, bring it up next week, and we'll see how it, uh, how it worked or did not work. Uh, Rick wants to know about G. You're probably not going to like G. Oh, I'm thinking of Gillette. This is a different one. The HV is pretty low on this. Now, if I just saw this chart and you didn't have the scaling over here, I'd say, ooh, that looks really good. But let's take a look at this. HV is 15. Okay, I think the Russell's 14, right? Yeah, it's like the same as the Russell, and the S&P is going to be a little bit. Let's take a look at Spider's, Spider's rate. Um, the market's usually around eh, 12 to 15 in HV. So I'm not a big fan of trading stocks that are less volatile than the overall market. And then remember, something bad could always happen. Now look at what happened back here, okay? I mean, if anything, I like the short stocks that are low in HV. Read the GoGo Nomo free report on my website. I'm kind of thinking about doing a... Um, like a list of all, the, like a an automatic delivery of all these free reports I have out there. If you're interested in that, let me know, and I'll uh, I'll set that up first chance. But you can see that this stock made a much larger than its normal volatility move way back here. So that's the point I'm trying to make: is something bad can still happen. So it looks like this huge massive trend that's ba that's only like two and a half points. Okay, and let's see what that is percentage wise. Let's just say, let's start from the beginning of May to now, 12% move. Okay, it's nothing to sneeze at, but take a look at, like, let's just see what Kim did from the beginning of May to now, at least on a closing base. You see a 27% move, okay? So much higher in volatility, volatility of 48. You know, this is a stock that I like, obviously. So I would encourage you to trade more volatile stocks with the caveat that on the short side, I do like, and I don't necessarily look at the HV, but for instance, we're short Morgan Stanley right now. And Morgan Stanley has an HV. Well, it's got a decent HV now, 25, but that's really not that high. I, I do tend to like big, thicker stocks with lower HVs on the short side because there's less danger of me getting caught in like a like a biotech stock with some new, a small biotech stock with some new drug coming out or something that's just going to, Double the stock overnight, and I'm going to be a hurt and pop, okay? So, yeah, I'd avoid that one just because it needs to go a little more. IMOS, okay? Yeah, this is kind of interesting. It's a semiconductor. Um, it's kind of gone straight up in here. So what I would like to see happen here, I'd like to see the mother of all knockout moves. Um, 
the HV, well, it's really not that big of a move, though, if you look at the HV on this thing. But it, looked, it looks a little better than the other one because it's made a pretty substantial move in here over a fairly short period of time. And percentage-wise, it's a little bit better than that other one was. It's 20-something percent over a short period of time. So what I would do is I would look for some sort of TKO move, maybe about down to 19 or so, and then look to get long. So, yeah, put it, in your, put it on your momentum list, but it's not set up. Easy for me to say. Mule looks okay. Um, it's not really jumping out at me, but I hear you. It broke out and it kind of pulled back. It, it unfortunately, it kind of pulled back to where it broke out from. But it looks okay. I mean, you could certainly you could certainly take this trade. There's it, if this was a, a stock that's been established over a long period of time. In other words, not an IPO then I might be a little bit uh, more critical of it. But keep in mind, with IPOs, there is a breakout characteristic. So let's let's add in a, a five-day moving average and take a look at, what's it called, Dave Landry's breakout. Somebody gave me a name last weekend, or last week, I should say. But yeah, it, they have a breakout characteristic, and if you're using this little five-day simple moving average pattern we talked about, you would actually have gotten long on this day here. So I think it looks okay. All right, Dennis wants to know about OSUR. OSUR sounds like a play on words. Um, Put it on your momentum list. My problem lately is that it makes this all-time high on expansion range, and then it just begins to meander in here, okay? So put it on your momentum list, but for me to get excited, it would have to break out again, and then I'd look to play a pullback somewhere along the way. So, yeah, put it on your momentum list, but it's not set up right now. Andre, you have picked the stock of the day. Congratulations and a high five to you. I cannot. Uh, Brett, oh, good job on that. You guys, are, wow. You know, you see, you're gonna make you you're gonna make me look bad because in those videos I said I, I talked a lot about the net net price change and some simple stock selection and stuff. And I'm like, you know, I'm beating a dead horse in this, but if you don't believe me, come to the next week in charts. Well, too many uh I'm getting too many smart people in here now. Yeah, good job on that uh, stock picking. SQ for Donald, that's going to be uh, Square stock, right? Um, yeah, it's 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 trending, but it needs to be on your momentum list. Let's look at my momentum list. I bet it's on there. there used to be a way to do this. Square. Let's see what we got. Let me... Yeah, there it is right there, square. So you put it in a minimum list, but it's not set up. So on a pullback, yeah, absolutely. A pullback, knockout, okay? That's what a good-looking momentum stock looks like, okay? Uh, you know, back here notwithstanding, but what does it do? It rallies. It bases. It rallies. It bases. It rallies. And kind of like Kemet does, okay? I mean, if you could figure out how to find these Darvis stocks ahead of time, and Darvish wrote a book, How I Made $2 million in the Stock Market. I'd recommend you read it. It's a good book. Very good introduction to technical analysis. Not that technical. He just buys stocks as they move from one box to the next. And I love these stocks like Kemet that, that rally up, make a base, rally up, make a base. Bigger the base, the further they go into space. Okay. So if you could figure out how to find these box stocks ahead of time, you would own the world because a lot of times they don't always develop like this, unfortunately. Now, way, the way I wrap my head around that, or the way I get into box stocks, such as Kemet, is that I wait for a setup like a TKO or a pullback, or in some cases we get in early on a bow tie, okay? And then we trail a stop higher, and if they turn into a box stock, fantastic, we're in for the ride. If they don't, we get stopped out, so what, okay? BSX for Ms. Jewel, 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 BSX. Um, HV is kind of low on this one. And 
the net net is not that exciting. I hear you. It's breaking out. It's making new highs. Eh, let it follow through or see if it can follow through. But this HV is a little too low for me to get excited about that. SORL for Mr. Andre. Sorrel. Yeah, I mean, put it on your momentum list, but it's not set up. I guess I better hide these. Not that I'm hiding anything. It's just sometimes you guys get lazy and start asking about stocks over there. Um, now, it has, made, it has made kind of a crazy extreme move, but I still like it. So, But if this has the mother of all knockout moves or the mother of all deep retracements, then maybe. But, yeah, put it on your watch list for sure. Donna wants to know about T2. Um, yeah, on a pullback, put it in the momentum list. This is not enough pullback in here based on the magnitude of move higher. But it does have some good good looking stock here, Donald. Uh, it does have some nice acceleration higher, but it needs a pullback. So yeah, put it on your momentum list, but not set up. Camp. Never heard of it. Um, semiconductor stock. Yeah, put it on your watch list, absolutely. A little bit on the thin side, but that's okay. Good volatility, it's okay because it's not too thin. Accelerating higher, yeah, that should, that belongs in your momentum list, but wait for a pullback. Co for Rick. Ah, it's a little wide and loose, um, but it's not bad. Uh, longer term, obviously, it's got some issues because it's all over the place, but it's kind of shaped up in more recent times, a little wide and loose. Uh, this one I have been watching. Right? I just find it's kind of interesting because just the name, China Cord Blood, you know. I wonder what that is. Uh, it looks okay. I personally would like to see it break out a little bit more and a little bit more momentum, but, you know, sometimes I'd look for too much perfection, which is actually a good thing, I think, in, in the markets. Not in my life. My, uh, I'm kind of a mess. <laughs> I, I have company over because to force me to clean up. Um but, yeah, I, I've got this one on my watch list, but I, it's just not jumping out at me as being set up right now. I hear you, though. Frack for Brett. My only problem with this one is that it's in the wrong sector. But, yeah, it looks good. I mean, I would almost give you a high five if it wasn't in oil and gas. We just looked at the energies. Energies look abysmal. But it, I have to admit, it looks pretty damn good. Now, this would have get, remember, we talked about this one extensively. When I was talking about Dave Landry's super duper breakout system or whatever, and I don't think it ever. I hope it didn't trigger. Um, I don't think it did. Yeah, because let's see, one, two, three, four, five. You couldn't have the moving average didn't exist until this day, the five-day moving average, and then it never did. I might be wrong on this one. I don't think it closed at a new. Oh, okay. The 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 high was set. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. The high was set on day one, and it never closed above that high, so you would have avoided the trade based on Dave Landry's five-day breakout IPO system. i got to figure out a way to put my name into these things. But, yeah, it looks good. It looks uh, it looks really good, uh, except for it's wrong sector, okay? But, you know, in a case like this, you could enter around 16, put a stop at 13. You know, if, if, it, if it triggers, fine, and if you get stopped out, you get stopped out, but... Good looking setup. High five on that. Wrong sector. So I'm going to pass. EXTR. I have to say, your stock picking, you guys, is getting much better in here. I'm not getting able. To, I'm not able to beat you guys up too much. Yeah, it's trending, but it's not set up. So put it in your put it in your watch list. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Jim, that one's on my Landry list for today. So I'll give you a high five on that one. But I can't talk about it, unfortunately. Have to go. Thanks a lot. God bless. Well, God bless you too. What's minimum HV should you consider for a stock from Jill? Um, I'm going to give you one of those. It depends answers. Okay. Depending on the market conditions, it varies. Okay. Now let's just talk about long only because remember on the short side, HV can be a little bit lower. In fact, in some cases you might actually want a lower HV. But it depends. And right now, I'm finding most of my opportunities above 30. Now, just real quick, remember that certain things can cause an aberration, such as persistency. So if you do have a stock in a nice persistent uptrend, 
the volatility will come off even though it's in a, a decent trend. So that's something to remember. But it depends on where your setups are stacking up based on the market conditions. Right now, you like take a look at the semis. They're rallying, looking pretty good. This is what hardware. Hardware looks okay. A um, lot of sectors at or near new highs. A lot of sectors in trends. So I'm able to find stocks with higher HVs, and I don't have to go much below 30 right now. And as a general statement, unless I'm really looking for shorts, and you could, this probably applies to all markets at all times, once I get below 30 in the HV, I tend to go through my scans much quicker, knowing that I'm probably not going to find a whole lot of like below 30. So the quick answer to your question is, other than it depends, is probably 30 or higher. But the long answer is it depends on market conditions and where the setups are stacking up. Okay. Let's say we get into a defensive market where foods and boring stocks like that, defense stocks such as tobacco, not defensive stocks like uh, not defense stocks like aerospace defense, but like tobacco, food, consumer non durables. People still have to poo in a bear market, right? So, or people still need deodorant in a bear market. So sometimes those consumer non durables and so-called defense issue, defensive issues can uh, provide some opportunities. And those HVs are going to be, as a general statement, really low. Okay, so it depends on the market conditions. But right now, I think you should be able to find stocks 30 or higher unless it's a very persistent trend and it's going down. See you, Phil. Mew. I watched a friend turn $5,000 into about a million dollars in this particular stock. And the rest of the story is not so good. It uh, he round tripped it. He was at like nine seventy something nine. I saw the last statement I saw. I want to say nine fifty nine. I told him to cash out, get an annuity, get like fifty k the rest of your life. You know, <laughs> I'm not gonna take financial advice from you. Well, he's no longer on this earth, so we can talk about him. Uh, HV is uh, decent. Okay. But the volume is incredible. This is a really thick stock. As a general statement, I'm not as excited about thick stocks. But pattern trumps everything, okay? And it did break out to new highs. In this particular case, I'd like to see some a little bit more solid breakout and then possibly a pullback. But, yeah, it's not bad. I think that within the semis, you might be able to find something a little bit thinner, okay? And... Uh, with a little bit more volatility, but it's not bad, okay? But put it on your momentum list. It's not set up. PYPL on a pullback. PYPL. Possibly, okay? There's a thick stock. Um, HV, not incredible, like 19, okay? And, you know, it's only gone, what, from 48 to, you know, five points. It's a 10% move in about three weeks or so. It's not bad. Uh, but, yes, on a pullback, possibly. We'll know it when we see it. Who's that? Justice Potter. Stewart. CTRL. Yeah, put this on your watch list. Obviously not set up. It's a little crazy back here. I'm not really a huge fan of stocks to make a huge gap and then kind of meander around. But it's kind of getting this act together. And so far, banging on new highs. Yeah, on a pullback. Put it in your watch list. Chop. Too many days in a pullback. Brett. Um, this one was on my Landry list. I don't know if I took it off or not. It's okay. Uh, this is the, the example of the TKO where I like to see him trigger a little bit uh, more quickly. It's okay. I mean, it's... I think I would pass. I think you could probably find something else out there, but it's certainly, I really can't pick it apart too much. But it's a case where I like to see that TKO again trigger like right away. And I don't remember whether I took it off my list or not. But yeah, you definitely get an okay on that one. <laughs> LNTH just bought it. Yeah, well, a lot of the stocks in here people just bought. I know that. 
I, did, I have a peer that's like, I don't like to have people to ask about individual stocks because I know they already bought them. I'm like, well, so what? I could care less. You know, it's like, lighten up, Francis. <laughs> let's see, why did Phil buy this? Let's put the 50-day moving average in. Let's see if we can figure out why he bought it and where. Uh, let's see, 50. So he just bought it. Oh. Well, the Phil buy would have been back here, right? The Phil Phil. Um. You know, as it looks now, it doesn't jump out of me. It is on my momentum list, or I have been watching it because it's making new highs. I would actually like to see this thing make accelerate higher and then pull back a little bit. Again, I often look for perfection in these setups. See, I'm just the opposite. I don't look for perfection in life. I look for perfection in markets. Race, that's Ferrara. Um. Yeah, on a pullback, put it in your momentum list, okay? I find it hard to believe that a stock like Ferrari can't be doing so well. But, hey, who am I to argue? Sina for Jim. Looks okay. Um, your main, it did get past this prior peak, as we saw. In last week's thing, uh, you know, I'm not ex super excited about stocks that have like one gap, a one day wonder type of, of, of thing. A lot of times you have a one day wonder, then it kind of erases all of it. It looks OK. Uh, maybe a slightly deeper pullback, but not too deep to erase too much of these gains. It, it certainly looks OK. I'd put it on a watch list. It just not it's not jumping out of me as a setup. But I can't pick it apart too much. Yeah, your stock picking has gotten much better in here, by the way. I might have to redo some videos that I did. It said, come to the next week in charts. Um, I would like to see a more solid breakout and then a pullback in this particular case. But, yeah, put it on your watch list. I-C-H-R is a stock. Oh, we've gone past time. Oops. <laughs> okay, I've got to, I need to wrap things up since we've gone so long. Um, I enjoy doing these shows. Obviously, it's a highlight of my week. I appreciate you guys and girls showing up, so thank you so much. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email, david, davelander.com. Uh, quick answer, I'll shoot it right back at you. Answers requiring thoughts will likely become fodder for the next show, so feel free to ask me questions if you have any. And again, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.